Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 168 and 169, which read as follows. Uttitthe nappa manjaya dhammang sucharitang suchari dhammachari sukhang seti asming loke paramhita Dhammang chare sucharitang nanang jut charitang chare Dhammachari sukhang seti asming loke paramhita Which means Utite napamanjaya One should not stand negligent Dhammang sucharitang chare One should fare righteously in the Dhamma. Uh, one, who, one who dwells by the Dhamma, Dhammachari, uh, rests in peace, rests in happiness in this world and the next. That's the first verse. The second verse, basically that says the same thing. One should fare righteously in the Dhamma, one should not uh, fare unrighteously in regards to the Dhamma. One who fares by the Dhamma, who lives by the Dhamma, dwells in happiness in this world and the next. The famous saying, Dhamma chari sukhang seti asming loke paramita. One who dwells in the Dhamma or fares by the Dhamma uh, finds happiness or lives happily in this world and the next. This story, this um, verse was told in relation to, or in regards to uh, the Buddha's first visit home after leaving. Uh, so we know the story of how the Buddha <coughs> left home as a prince, cut off his hair and, and renounced his throne. And there's different accounts of why he did, of, of how it happened, but um, the account of why he did it is pretty clear. He He became disturbed by the the reality of life and how how meaningless the ambition and the the, the the goals and the the framework of the household life, how, how meaningless it was in the face of reality, in the face of old age, sickness and death. Meaning if you're going to get old, sick and die, what's the point to engage in, um, in the pursuit of, of sensual pleasure? Now, for most people, it would seem like um, It would seem absurd to, to to express concern over the life of a prince, right? You know, a person's born into luxury, you'd think, boy, what do they have to complain about? You know, he's got it made, is what we'd say. Many people who come to practice meditation, it's because their life is not so good. And uh, they've, they've experienced suffering in their lives, and they have this question of how to deal with it. How can I deal with it? And I think, well, for a prince, it has no such concern. Why should they bother practicing? And, and it's true that it took the Buddha a long time, it seems, or the Bodhisatta, a long time to, to have any reason to question the life that he had been born into. Um, but finally, this it, the awareness of 
how even the most uh, intense or imp impressive or high, high life of luxury couldn't protect one from suffering and in the end is, is inadequate to address the question of the problem of suffering and all the happiness and pleasure that comes from living a luxurious life ends up being philosophically meaningless you know, or, or even worse becomes a, a, a problem in the, the grand scheme of things because it, uh, it sets one up for you know, great suffering both in this life and the next. So in this life, you know, there's this idea that well, if you have power and money, you can you can avoid any sort of suffering. But of course, that's not true. You can still get sick. You still get old. You still die. And if you're full of attachment, you know, any kind of uh, actually, in fact, when you're full of attachment, it doesn't take old age, sickness, and death to create suffering, right? I think, wow, the life of a prince must be wonderful, but all that happens when you have great luxury is you become more sensitive. And uh, you, know, you have a greater at attachment and thus a greater need for pleasure. And when the pleasure is gone, there's greater suffering. So rich people tend to be what we call spoiled, right? And we use this word spoiled to, to describe sort of person who's really just very sensitive and the slightest disturbance, the slightest disappointment leads to great suffering and anguish and often anger and, and you know, uh, unwholesomeness, which mean, mean, makes us call them spoiled. Um, but but more so, it, because it sets you up with such attachment. You know, this is what you're left with when you die. And regardless of what you think about the afterlife, it's really not a good conclusion to your life if you think about. If you're, you know, you're, many people don't have a belief that there is anything after death. But whether you do or or don't. It's hardly a, a noble end to your life. This person was, this person died with such great craving in their mind. It's not something that is in any way inspiring. This person was very greedy. I mean, when Buddhism talks about the next life and, and, and rebirth and so on, it's really just as a, as a matter of fact extension of this, that in the same way that we see cause and effect working in this life, right? if a person is full of addiction, they're going to be, or, or if, if a person is engaged in um, acquiring good things, well, then they're going to, they're going to become addicted and uh, that will change their personality and it will lead to disappointment and so on and so on. That our actions and our, our, our inclinations have consequences. We know this in this life. In Buddhism, the, the whole idea of the afterlife is just that that continues, that death is... Mm, it's only, our concept of death is only a consequence of how we look at the world, which is from a physical point of view. When in fact we're us looking at the world has nothing to do with the physical, it's a mental thing. Even in order to look at the world from a physical point of view, you require the mind, and so the mind is primary. And if the mind is primary, then the death of the body is not, it's not in that way significant. I mean, it's significant in other ways, but it doesn't end the the experience of reality. And so we continue. So in this world and the next, that's what this verse says. So 
and the, the, the prince realized this, left home, became enlightened, you know, figured out what was the problem and what was actually significant. You know, he, he solved the equation, how you've become free from suffering. You know, you take the desire out of the equation. When the, when the desire is gone, and suffering is gone. You know, there's no potential for disappointment. There's no potential for lacking. You can't lack what you want if you have no wanting. And so, and that, you know, that, that uh, theoretically sounds reasonable, but pra he found that practically it's so. And practically it's, in fact, um, this, it's, a, it's the most profound sense of peace and happiness there is. That's enlightenment. And uh, and then he got an invitation to return home. You know, he wasn't... He, he hadn't really thought about going home, but the king, uh, his father, Sudhodana, sent... The story goes that he sent... Uh, he sent his... his whatever, his uh, royal servants to go and, and fetch the or invite the prince, no, invite the Buddha to come back and, and visit. Because the Buddha had started to become famous, I guess. Or whatever, the, he, he went out to find him. And when the messenger came to the Buddha, uh, they would listen to the Buddha's teaching. They would come and see the Buddha teaching and listen. And they'd decide to become a monk. But because they hadn't asked permission in advance from the king to become a monk, they, after becoming a monk, they didn't deliver their message. The, the first, you know, this happened, the messenger didn't deliver the message. So the king waited, and the messenger didn't, didn't return, and so he sent another messenger. Same thing happened. The messenger listened to the Buddha's teaching, decided to become a monk, was too scared to tell the Buddha to go and visit the king because uh, they hadn't asked permission to become a monk. And again and again this happened until finally... One of the messengers said, okay, I'll, I'll do it, but you got to give me permission first to become a monk. And the king, the king said, okay, fine, you can become a monk, just make sure you let him know and invite him to come back. And so this man, uh, when he got there, he, he asked permission to become a monk, he became a monk. And then after the rains, he, walked, he came up to the Buddha and he said, Oh, look at the, after the rains, it's the perfect time to travel. And he starts, his, he, there's this verse that's in the, in the texts about him extolling the virtues of traveling in the, in the dry season. Because after, after October, November, it's no longer raining in India. And it's a wonderful time to, to travel. And it's such a beautiful, you know, na nature is so beautiful and weather's so good. And the, and the Buddha's like, the Buddha says, what are, you, what are you getting at? And then he blurts it out. He says, oh, the king invited you to come back to Kapila, the city of Kapila Watu. Kapila Watu means the city of Kapila. Or Kapila Pura. And so the Buddha went back. And there's a long story about what happened. He, the boss, to sum it up, he, uh, he taught all of his relatives he came. They came and uh, listened to him t teach. And none of them. Uh, th and after the teaching, none of them invited him to go for food. You know, he is a traveling monk with all of his followers, and nobody thought to say, "Hey, you know, where are you staying while you're here? Who's going to feed you? You've come to visit." Uh, and, and it may be that they all assumed that he would stay with the king, and the king as well assumed that he would come and stay in the palace. But that's not really how a Buddha, that's, that's not at all how it works with, with a Buddha. And you'll notice a pattern here. It's a, an interesting part of the culture. Right? The Buddha wasn't invited somewhere, and so uh, he didn't go. He was invited to teach. When the Buddha became enlightened, he had no intention to teach, and then he was invited to teach. 
He had no intention of returning home, and then he was invited to return home. He had no intention of... I mean, it's hard to say he had no intention, that's not perhaps fair, but there was no... Uh, the Buddha made no, made no move to, to go home. And the same uh, here, he, had, he was not invited to, to dine at the palace, and so he made no assumption. And in fact, he thought to himself, it seems that uh, rather than even going to the, the palace for alms, that wouldn't really be the way the Buddha do, does things. He thought back, what, what, what would a Buddha do? He often would think like this, that what do other Buddhas do? What is the tradition of the Buddhas? And he, th he thought about it and he realized the tradition of the Buddhas is to go uh, from house to house. You know, it doesn't matter, you start at whatever house is first in, in the gate of the city. And so he walked into the city and he went from house to house and taking whatever food people were offering. in what we call um, the alms round, right? Pindapata. Pindapata is an interesting, it's an interesting tradition and a lot of, there's a lot of, from non-Buddhists it, it, it provides, for non-Buddhists it provides a, uh, a potentially negative picture. Of, of Buddhism because it appears that, or of monks anyway, there's a, there's a sense of parasitism, right? Monks, or, or if not parasitism, there's a sense of um, lack of responsibility. Like, yes, yes, being a monk is all nice if you can get it, kind of thing, if you can get that gig, because you don't have to you know, do the work, people look after you. And it's, in a sense, it's like this privileged state. And it sometimes looks that way, that uh, it's this privileged sta state, because obviously no, not everyone can become a monk, or who would feed them? Not everyone can become a religious person. And that's certainly true, but... Uh, I mean, beyond that, there's a sense that it's just wrong to live your life and, and not take care of yourself, right? Here is a person who is not providing for their own livelihood. They are not working for their food. And there's a sense that somehow working for your food is, is right, which is reasonable. I mean, this is sort of the view of, of the general populace, and that there's something wrong with, uh, with taking food from people who give it. So the, the key distinction, I mean, I think you could say there is something wrong for someone who goes and begs for food. Because the question, well then, you're asking me for food, well, why should I give you food? Why am I, why should, why should you have a right to ask that of me? I, mean, so I think that's really an important distinction. Um, because... You know, a big part of the Dhamma is the practice of goodness. And I think what what really started, I mean, it wasn't, Amjran wasn't something that the Buddha inst, inst, instigated. I mean, he wasn't the first recluse in India to, to go on alms round, on alms round, to accept food as a gift. Um, but... He, he, it was one of those practices that he agreed wholeheartedly with because it's a practice of the Dhamma. So again, these verses are about dhamma chari, right? the practice of the Dhamma. And the practice of generosity is a practice of the Dhamma. And so what he saw was not people who felt obliged to give food to religious people. He saw people who wanted to give food to religious people. Uh, in, in a parallel in the West, I think, is um, people who give money to students for scholarship, right? people who give scholarship money. And we do that because we appreciate and we, we, we understand that it's 
for a good cause, right? Now, the students, um, they don't need it. They could instead go and work at Burger King or something like that, but, but then they wouldn't be able to go to school. This is a person who has given up the opportunity to do manual labor, so they're not going to work for their food or for their whatever. We don't want to make. The, we don't want them to have to work. We want to give them free tuition, right? We want to allow them the opportunity to live for free, um, provided they're doing something which we see as as beneficial, and it's beneficial to them certainly. But we believe beneficial to the world. It's better to have educated people. That's sort of a Western concept. That's very similar. Um, and of course, from a Buddhist perspective, the support of people who are practicing pro good religion, right? who are doing or, or developing their minds in, a, in such a fundamental way, it's far greater than learning uh, foreign languages or, or studying philosophy. Well, philosophy is not so bad, but studying engineering or something like that, which is practical, but not on par with studying your own mind. And so he, the Buddha wholeheartedly agreed with this, this practice and saw that it was a, it was a perfect solution because there were people who were keen to solve the problem of life, you know, solve this problem of, of suffering, to do something that was very good, of ultimate good to themselves, but, uh, but really just an ultimate good. You, know, you, could, you could, of course, argue that it's very, very good for, for society and the world for more people to become enlightened. Um, but he saw that it was a great practice for those who, who give. You know, when a person gives, they are they given support of the cultivation of goodness, the cultivation of enlightenment. And they themselves are uh, following along they are respecting and, and supporting that practice and they're, they're aligning themselves with that practice. I mean, generosity is not a part of the path. It's not like you meditators have to find a time every day to give something. That's not, not a part of your practice, even though even for someone who is on the path to enlightenment, it's not a part of the path, but it is an incredibly great support. The Buddha extols the virtues of giving because, in general, it, it calms the mind and it strengthens the mind. And so it's a great support for anyone who wants to practice meditation. And at any rate, it's not harming the person. You know, a person who gives to a Buddhist wants to give, gives to a, a, a Buddhist monk. And it, I mean, it's a broader question of whether it's, it's okay to accept gifts. Right, and really, it comes down to a question of whether you're, you you deserve the gift. It's not a question of whether uh, you're imposing upon the person, because the person who gives gifts, unless it's again getting back to Christmas and where it is kind of, people feel obligated to. But when people give a gift because they want to, Uh, we were talking about. I was talking about this earlier, and they're in fact using you. They're 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 using you because to to attain their own goals. Right? When someone gives you a gift, thinking it makes me happy to give, for example, you don't do them any favors by declining it. Right? You're, you're declining them the pleasure, the happiness, and and really the goodness and the the kindness that they're developing this cultivation of good qualities. So when someone gives to you, it's really nothing to do with you, it's all to do with them. And 
So the, the, the alms round is really just a taking advantage of people's, um, their, their practice that's for themselves. But it's taking advantage of it in order to practice something that's good for yourself. I think it's. Um, I think we, it, it's hard for Westerners to appreciate, and I know I've, I've had some people who actually tried to become a monk but couldn't do it because they weren't able to swallow this idea of accepting food from people. Um, and I think it's a it's just a misunderstanding um, that in fact you know, people will only do something good because they want to do it and. Whether they want to do it or not, it's, it's a good to give, right? Even if someone were to feel obligated to do something like that, that's their problem, and, the, and the, you know, the, the fact that they're doing it is always going to be a good thing. And so you should never be ashamed that someone wants to give you something. You should only consider, are you worthy to accept it? Anyway, so that's all about the alms round. And, the king, uh, the king found out that he was waiting for the Buddha, I guess, and probably prepared some food for the Buddha. And when the Buddha never came, he found, tried to find out where he was, found out he was going on alms and went riding off on his elephant, perhaps, to find the, the Buddha and said, he came before the Buddha and said, you know, what are you doing? Why are you humiliating me like that? It's another thing that it feels humiliating, like, Again, you're 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 a beggar. It is humbling. I mean, to again, you're not you, you aren't working for this. These people don't have any obligation to give to you, and yet here they are. They want you to have this food, and uh, the king said, you know. The, the, this isn't this isn't the way I raised you, kind of thing. And the Buddha said, "Oh, I didn't mean to humiliate you. I'm just following the way of my lineage." And the king said, "What is it? Our tradition in the, in our family to do this?" And the Buddha said, "No, but it's tradition in my family from Buddha to Buddha. It's a tradition of the Buddhas to to eat only what is given. I mean, the alms round is." The, the reason for it, and the reason why the Buddha picked it up as a as a practice, is because it answers the question of how do you live dedicated to cultivating wholesome states, cultivating your mind. Um, how do you, how do you live dedicated day and night to the practice of meditation and mental development without dying? So it was a question of how do you provide for your needs? And it wasn't a question that only the Buddha asked. This was a question that was, this was the religious uh, environment in the time of the Buddha. Everybody was doing this. There were many monks or many recluses or ascetics who would go into the village accepting food from people who wanted to support them, people who thought, hey, this is a great thing to do. It didn't seem unreasonable because people liked it. Sometimes it was family members, sometimes it was just rich people who you know, didn't have any interest in becoming religious themselves, but had a, a sense, a right sense, of how great it is to give, and especially how great it is to support people who are doing good things. And again, everyone had different ideas of what was a good thing and what was good religion, but in general there was a sense of camaraderie and a sense of harmony in, in this way. Um, and so, you know, the, the Buddha had the, this, picked it up as a tradition because of how it solves the problem of living as a religious person. And it fits nicely in with the Dhamma. So the Buddha said, you know, this is the tradition of the Buddha and one should not be this is the practice of the Dhamma, is basically what he said. And one should not be negligent when practicing the Dhamma, and then he taught these verses. So 
So what does this teach us? Well, I talked a little bit about some of the things that it involves, but um, again, it, it fits the idea of alms round, first of all, it fits quite nicely in with uh, the practice of enlightenment because it's about trying to free yourself from from desire. If you if you have as a as a goal freedom from attachment, then it gets quite difficult to survive, right? And so you have to ask, well how does such a person stay alive? You know, a person who wants food, how do they manage to free themselves from that desire and still and still live, right? They get hungry and, and they want to eat and then they think, well, if I go and, and, if I go and uh, gratify this desire, I'm just encouraging it, I'm perpetuating that desire. And, and that, I mean, that problem becomes quite, uh, rel quite um, pronounced in a person who, who takes up a job and makes money, right? There's there's just the potential for such desire, and you have to ask, well, why is this person doing this if if they have no desires, or a person who's wishing for no desires is going to have a really hard time if they're um, or or it's it's hard to it's hard to justify why they're if they're if Pers this person is intent upon freeing themselves from desire, why are they so intent upon getting what they want, right? Because ideally a person is just dedicated to meditation, and meaning dedicated to a pure mind, and would never give in to a, a, a desire to eat. I mean, hunger is just a feeling, and you experience this as meditators. In the evening, in the beginning, you crave food, but later on, you just feel this weakness. We call it hunger, and it's interesting when you see that hunger is is has a physical and a mental component. The physical component is just a tiredness or a weakness in the evening, which it comes and it goes. But the hunger is really mental, the the craving, the desire for food, and so once you give that up, well. Or if you if you're mindful enough to to what we'd say suppress it because of you know being mindful of the feeling, so that it never arises the desire for it, then how do you survive? And so the alms round was sort of designed for that. You find that as you practice, sometimes a meditator will get so strong in their meditation that they they really feel it's a chore to even go to the kitchen and get food. Um, so, in order to find a, a way to make this work, you know, the, the, this is how why the Buddha accepted and why it was in generally accepted practice to receive food that was given. And a monk can't uh, can't even go and take food that was designated for them. If someone says, "Oh, I left some food for you," they can't even go and take it then. It's a means of, of creating a strict sort of practice that, again, it's artificial, but that allows you to um, to stay as, as close as you can to not wanting anything and, and, and to free you from the potential for obsessing about things like food and so on. And the same goes with, with clothes. You know, the Buddha talked about trying to get rags for your clothes and so on. Anyway, um, so yes, the alms round fits quite nicely in with the Dhamma, but it, and, and the Buddha talks about it as, it as a practice of the Dhamma. A person who goes on alms round is practicing the Dhamma because they're intent upon this non-attachment to, to one's own life and, and, of course, to one's own pleasure. They're intent upon freeing themselves from hunger, from the desire for good food or this food or food in general. And so they just take as a practice to 
go around and, and accept whatever food is being offered, right? Because again, when someone gives you food, it's all about them, so, well, fine, if, you, if you're doing that, then great, I get some food. I get some food and it's blameless because it had nothing to do with me. You wanted to give and that was your practice. People give for all sorts of strange reasons, and often very good reasons, but sometimes they give because they want to make a wish to have children, and that's a religious practice you see in India and, and other Buddhist countries as well. So they think by doing this good deed it will help them get pregnant. There's a lot of strange ideas. Um, but about the verse in, in general, uttite na pamajaya dhammang sucharitang chari. One should not, uh, one should not be negligent in the dhamma. So, I think how it relates to the story quite well is, and how it relates to our practice, is this idea about being vigilant in regards to our practice of the dhamma. That everything we do, we should um, reflect on whether it's in line with the Dhamma, like the Buddha said to Rahula. When you do something, you should reflect on, on whether it's in line with the Dhamma, and you should see how there arises wholesome or unwholesome states. And don't be negligent in everything you do. So the Buddha questioned if, if he had gone to the palace, what would it be? Would that be in line with the Dhamma? If he had gone uninvited to the palace and, and just had some kind of expectation of being served as a prince, how would that be? Clearly that sort of activity is, is, is a problem because the potential for obviously not, not actually being attached to it but appearing to be attached to the luxury, it would set a very bad example. And uh, I, th I think following that example, it's the kind. Of, it's it would, it would, the idea is that we should be careful that when we do things, that they're not not that they're not setting a bad example, but they're not setting us up for a potential um, a potential rising of unwholesomeness. Right? We should think: if I do this, will this? be a danger for me and for my practice, right? Should I go to the palace for breakfast? You know, you think, if, if should I go to this luxury restaurant for food? That's a very dangerous thing to do. Because uh, there's a great greater potential for attachment and you know, distraction from your practice. Is why we don't have meditators talk on the phone or look at the internet or we don't have them read books or we don't have them do all sorts of things. And so uh, on, a, on a general level, this is the kind of advice that everyone should pick up whether they're meditating or not. Um, as meditators, I think it comes down to being very careful in everything you do. If I walk up the stairs, that's going to be dangerous. Because as I walk up the stairs, I might get distracted. So I should be very mindful. When I brush my teeth, I might get distracted. When I go in the shower, I might get caught up in the pleasure of the shower. When I eat the food that they have here, even though it's maybe not the food that I want, I still could get caught up in desire or... or uh, craving, or even aversion to the food. This is what is meant by, by vigilance, apamad, apamadja, napamadjaya, being vigilant. Because then he reminds us that it's practicing by the Dhamma, it's faring in the Dhamma, living by the Dhamma. This is what leads to happiness in this life or the next. Now you notice that, again, in Buddhism, the focus is not so much on happiness as it is on goodness. 
if we were to talk about and try to describe Buddhism, I think that would be a good way to describe it. Buddhism is not about happiness so much as it is about goodness. And it's not so much about ending suffering as it is about ending the cause of suffering. Right? We always talk about Buddhism in terms of ending suffering and finding happiness, but it's not really. And the focus in Buddhism isn't really in that. And that's because happiness doesn't lead to happiness and suffering doesn't lead to suffering, not necessarily. Suffering is not the cause of suffering and happiness is not the cause of happiness. So if you get rid of suffering, you haven't ended suffering. <laughs> if you get rid of some suffering, you're not reassure ensured that there will be no suffering. And if you find happiness, if you find out uh, if you get happiness, doesn't mean you're going to be happy because of it. You know, not self-perpetuating. Whereas goodness is the cause of happiness, and unwholesomeness, badness, evil is the cause of suffering. So he says that in this life and the next, one who dwells lives by the Dhamma, will, uh, lives by goodness. Dhamma here means goodness, really will be happy in this life and the next. Righteousness lives by what is right. And we talked, uh, I think on Saturday, there was a lot of uh, some ideas about some of the ways that one lives by the Dhamma. Studying, for example, living in seclusion, living simply, um, developing one's mind, and of course becoming enlightened. I know as uh, in the med during the meditation course it can be quite a struggle and often feels like uh, this isn't a very happy thing. It's, if you've just come to practice new, I think in fact everyone here is not a new meditator, but you can still get uh, discouraged at times by how unpleasant it can be. And you wonder, well, you know, where's the happiness? Sometimes it feels not the, not like you're, like you're maybe suffering less, but you're not finding happiness. Right? And uh, so the answer, I mean, the answer really is what well, is it? Is the question? Well, if you're if you have less suffering, are you not more happy? Because if our happiness is to be measured by moments where we feel what some kind of pleasant, pleasurable feeling, well then, I mean, first of all, you, you can't be sure that you're going to feel those feelings, but more importantly, you can't have those feelings when you're suffering. And so, what the Buddha saw, and, and how the Buddha describes, and how we describe in Buddhism, let's say, this idea of happiness, is in terms of freedom from suffering. Because if without suffering, if you don't have a state of, of suffering, where you're, where you're displeased, where you're unhappy, then there are two alternatives. The only other experiences you could have are neutral experiences, which um, are probably, for most people, more common than positive experiences, but then the other one is positive experiences. And uh, so the question, the question isn't so much of finding positive experiences as it is of, of getting rid of the negative ones. And so when we look at meditation, why it can be so unpleasant? Maybe because Not because it's the practice of living happily. Meditation is not exactly the practice of living in happiness. It's the practice of getting rid of the unhappiness. And so it's like if you want, the goal is to have a clean house, right? And to live peacefully in your house, live happily in your house, to enjoy the house. 
But you can't do that if the house is dirty. So you have this activity that we call cleaning. And you think, well, cleaning's not fun. Cleaning's not happiness. How could cleaning be good for me? How could cleaning be at all related to having this happiness of living in the house? I mean, it's quite obvious, I think, right? It's not a, it's, that's not hard to understand. Meditation is about cleaning the mind, and it's not a very pleasant experience sometimes because it's about getting rid of dirt, and so there's a lot of dirt involved. It's about getting rid of suffering, so there's a lot of suffering involved. If you want to if you want to kill a tiger, you have to deal with a live tiger, right? You have to wrestle with it event and potentially get hurt by the tiger as you wrestle with it. If you want to get rid of your defilements, you have to deal with your defilements, wrestle with them. Sometimes it hurts. Because your defilements are you know, they're fighting back. They're they're, they're habitual. And so the, the happiness that comes isn't, the med isn't really supposed to be during the meditation. Really, it isn't supposed to be. You're supposed to be pushing yourself, working further and further and further, deeper and deeper and deeper, always suffering, always involved with suffering, um, to root out the deeper ones, so that when you don't meditate, so that the result is greater happiness. Now, of course, as you go along, you've... you've worked out many of the core sufferings, and so you are happier. You are happier, but your experience is still quite involved with suffering. I mean, this is how we understand this as meditators. And of course, I mean, as advanced meditators, you can, I'm sure, vouch for the benefits when you go home and how changed your life becomes for the better, and how much happiness and, and peace there is because you're no longer caught up in all those things that caused you suffering. You may not always have a, a positive feeling, a happy feeling, but your sense of peace and your, the, the freedom, if you think back, the, the difference from when you were not meditating, the amount of stress that you had and, and suffering, and it's really like night and day. Once you learn to see the cause of suffering and free yourself from that. So one who dwells by the Dhamma, that's in this life, in this life you, you see great happiness. But the Buddha reminded us that in, in the next life as well. The next life teachings are often fairly... Um, designed for a general audience. They're not very deep teachings, right? Because we don't really want to focus too much on the next life, but um, teachings about the next life are about the afterlife, about rebirth and so on, are useful even for meditators as a, as a point of reflection to remind us of the profundity of what we're doing. <clears throat> this isn't just like exercising your body that allows you to you know, perform functions in this life better. Exercising your body isn't going to have long-term um, consequences because the body's going to die. This we can verify. We've seen evidence for that. Um, but the mind, the mind isn't going to die. And if you think in terms of, of rebirth, then the practice of meditation becomes, this is why the, the why the Bodhisattva left home and, and why many people decide to dedicate their lives to this is because of how much more meaningful it is. How the only thing that really has long-term significance is the nature of your mind, the nature of your body, the state of your body, healthy, strong, even the nature of your brain as having good memory or so on, doesn't have great significance in the long term. But the quality of your heart, I'd say, that has great significance, both in this life and in lives to come. 
So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. That's the verse, two verses. Live by the Dhamma, for the Dhamma leads to happiness. Live by the Dhamma here means righteousness, goodness. All of the things that we're cultivating here, the things that people cultivate by giving charity, or even received by, uh, by, or even practiced by receiving charity, by deciding to live a life that um, is free from from the ambition involved with with employment and money and so on. When someone decides to live the life of a Reckless in the forest and eat food that is given out of out of faith and out of appreciation. So that's the Dhammapada. Thank you all for listening. Have a good.